<clears throat> the following interview was conducted with John, Professor John S. Day, the Herbert C. Craner Professor of Management Emeritus for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, September 24, 2009 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History of Bern. Good afternoon, Professor Day, and welcome. Well, uh, welcome to you. Thank you. And would you like, like to start off if you'll tell us where and when you were born and your parents and siblings in early years? Okay. Uh, I was born uh, in October 13, 1917 in Newton, Massachusetts. Uh, my father at that time was uh, sort of a, <laughs> a mechanic, uh, bicycle repairman and so forth, and my mother was a housewife and also uh, a sales lady. Um, after uh, several years, uh, because of uh, the fact that my mother and father were divorced, I went to live with my grandmother and actually was raised by her uh, <coughs> through the years until I uh, reached uh, uh, majority age. Uh, <coughs> the uh, early days, uh, of course, uh, were filled with a lot of <laughs> reminiscence. Of course. Uh, I uh, attended uh, public schools in Boston, and uh, my grandmother, a uh, uh, dear lady, was a real matriarch, and uh, about every three or four years, she suddenly decided that she'd move, and I never really know the reason why, uh, at least in uh, one uh, situation, I knew it because the people, the person who owned the house wanted to uh, come back and live in it. Uh, as a result, uh, uh, I got to experience a lot of things uh, that uh, perhaps a person who had only gone to uh, one school in one area would uh, not have uh, had the chance to uh, experience. Uh, actually, uh, the, uh, uh, I, all those years I was in the Boston public school system, but uh, living in places like Roxbury, which I wouldn't dare go back to now, and Jamaica Plain and Roslindale, and finally Brighton. Uh, I, uh, you went right? to you went to Boston's Technical High School, didn't you? Yes, I did. Okay, uh, and tell us maybe uh, tell us a little about that. Well, uh, gladly. Uh, since uh, my family uh, were my uh, the male members of my family were very experienced and well paid uh, top craftsmen in their field. Uh, in fact, uh, to be honest, I never really uh, felt the pangs of the uh, depression since. Uh, I had a grandfather who was a senior railroad engineer with a very strong union, an uncle who was in the Boston Police Department, and so forth and so on, all of whom lived with us and contributed to the family. Mm -hmm. uh, as a result, they uh, all felt that both of these type of gentlemen felt that I really should become an engineer. Uh, as I said, there had been no uh, college graduates in my family up to that day. So, uh, uh, we checked around, and uh, the two schools at the time, which seemed to be the best preparation, were English High, and uh, at that time, what was called Mechanic Arts High. Uh, and, that, and so the latter I went. And that was an interesting experience, because under the Boston school system, you could go to any high school that you uh, wanted to, regardless of its location. And therefore, the Mechanic Arts High, later Boston Technical High, uh, had a very diverse <laughs> student body from all over the town, all over the city. Mm -hmm. uh, it had a program which uh, today doesn't probably exist, uh, uh, along with the uh, more mundane sub subjects of uh, mathematics and chemistry and physics and so forth for the, for the college prep uh, program, which is the one I attended. Uh, they, uh, they also had shop courses. Uh, and if you can believe this, one of them was in blacksmithing. How about that? That's, that's <laughs> coming back, you know. You come out to, uh, you know, the fort. <laughs> well, it has. Well, I'll be damned. I wasn't a very good blacksmith. And, uh, <laughs> I made the mistake uh, one time of uh, disobeying my instructors uh, never to work uh, uh, on, a, on a piece of steel that had got, gotten dark. And as a result, I knocked it off the forge. I picked up the wrong end. And... Uh, for the next uh, several weeks, I had to come in at 7.30 in the morning to make up the work that I lost because I couldn't <laughs> use that hand. Uh, and there were such things as pattern making, which I did very well in machine shop and so forth. Mm -hmm. A lot of hands-on. A lot of hands-on. Uh, uh, and uh, it was an experience which uh, I really uh, look back on it and think it was a good preparation. Sure. Um, 
at any rate, uh, along the way, uh, uh, I uh, had to face up to what school or college I was going to, and of course MIT and Tufts Engineering were the two uh, predominant ones in Boston. I went over and visited MIT, and I thought, mm, that's more theoretical than I like, but the Tufts really seemed to be more a hands-on kind of school. And so uh, I elected to go to Tufts, and I might point out in those days, there was no trouble getting in either one of those schools. Okay. Uh, uh, and so long as you had the money, you could get in. That's right. You could walk through the doors. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and uh, at any rate, uh, uh, I enrolled in uh, in uh, Tufts and uh, had a fairly successful first year. And then, uh, lo and behold, I discovered horses. I, uh, a friend of mine, were right, going by a riding school at the end of my freshman year in the summer afterwards. And, uh, we passed this riding school, and I said to him, uh, gee, wouldn't it be fun to try and find out if we could ride a horse? Neither one of us had any experience whatsoever. So we did, in fact, uh, next week go over and pay a buck and uh, uh, bounced around <laughs> in the saddle for an hour and a half, and uh, I loved it. And uh, so that, that summer I was working uh, diligently uh, as a general uh, uh, a general aid uh, in a, uh, a machine shop, a uh, special metalworking shop, uh, and uh, as a result I had a, a couple of bucks that I would not, not have otherwise had. My, after I paid my grandmother ten dollars for board, I had five dollars left to spend on as I wanted to. And so I spent them on horses, and one thing led to another, and uh, I became pretty proficient and eventually ended up as an instructor at the riding school, working on weekends and so forth. Good. And then fate intervened, the owner, and I might point out this, an interesting thing, it's something, an experience I had, which probably no other professor at Purdue the time I was there had, is as a young man at college age, I worked for several years on weekends and, and, uh, and in the afternoons for a black man and uh, he had ran this riding school. Okay. And uh, was in fact a uh, uh, a uh, immigrant from uh, Canada. His family were one of the families that had, during, uh, after the uh, end of the war, the British had taken them to Halifax to keep the slave owners from uh, uh, claiming them mm -hmm. at the revolution. Okay. So at any rate, uh, I had that. Then I had another experience. Uh, uh, I started to go, uh, I started to uh, get involved in the Sea Scout ship, and uh, well, if I do say so, uh, the skipper we had uh, uh, was uh, not the best, uh, he was a lot of a land lover, and uh, he embarrassed uh, the troop one day when we were down uh, in the harbor and uh, having a get-together with some other uh, uh, Sea Scout ships, and walking from one the Sea Scout ship that was moored alongside the other, he fell in between, still carrying his cup of coffee. And to say, say that made a, a distinct impression on some of the other people, was to put it mildly. I would say so. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> At any rate, uh, the um, end result was that I became very active in it and gradually took over the leadership of it. Uh, uh, became the mate and eventually became the skipper and built it up to, in, in Boston, we had uh, one of the largest uh, enrollments of Sea Scouts of any ship in the area. Sure. We eventually got our own boat, a Navy captain's gig, and got that running and cruising that. And then finally, uh, uh, I had been going with a girl uh, since my junior in high school, and uh, on a blind date, uh, over the Christmas vacation, because my best friend, at Tufts had come to me and said, John, you've really got to help me out. I want to date with this wonderful girl. I've been seeing her and she refuses a date until just this last day when she said that if I could find a date for her buddy, uh, who, since they planned to uh, go out together that, that same day, uh, she would uh, consent to a date with him. And much against my uh, <laughs> uh, will, because I really didn't want to get involved, uh, I agreed. Well, to make a long story short, I fell for my wife, and uh, 
uh, eventually uh, we were married for 54 years. Okay, sounds uh, good. Uh, and, but the, only, the trouble was now I had uh, a Sea Scout ship to run of some 30 teenagers. Remember the Sea Scouts are 15 to 18. And that's a tough group of students, of young men to handle. I would say so. And uh, then I had uh, my horses and the owner of the riding school, as I mentioned earlier, had finally gotten to the point where he really uh, trusted me and so that fall, at the beginning of my sophomore year, he said to John, uh, uh, why don't you uh, take over Belle? Belle was a new horse he just bought. He said, she's not fit for our customers to ride. And he said, uh, if you could ride her all went along, whenever you got a chance, I think by spring you'll have her calm down to the point where uh, she can be used in the, the regular uh, routine of, of uh, riding. So here I had a horse of my own, a sea scout ship, and a lovely girlfriend, and I really didn't pay any attention to my studies. <laughs> How could you? Where where was the other time? You know, it just the twenty fifth well, hour was not there. <laughs> so at any rate, uh, Dean Burden, whose name I remember, in the spring term called me in and he said, John, he said, uh, you've got a problem. He said, uh, as you know, I put you on probation in the fall, but you don't seem to be doing anything about it. And uh, he said, now you're causing me a personal embarrassment. And I said, well, how, how is that, Dean? He said, well, you know, my son is in some of your classes. I said, yes. He says, he, when I try to get him to study, he says, well, I don't have to study. John Day doesn't study, and he's doing all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, learn by example. <laughs> Something so, like that. At any rate, uh, the end result was that uh, uh, I didn't do very well. I flunked a couple of courses. And... Uh, I was really fed up with engineering. I blamed it all the fact I wouldn't have made a good engineer. Whether I would or not, who knows? But okay. The, the, the fact of the matter was, the dean thought I would have made a good engineer because when I asked for a transfer to liberal arts, he said, no way. I'm not <laughs> going to authorize a transfer to liberal arts when I know that your only problem is lack of study and lack of work. And so uh, I ended up that, uh, that year uh, uh, very unhappy uh, and uh, really no desire to go back to uh, the engineering program in the fall. Meanwhile, about uh, May or June, who should show up on the campus but a, a Marine recruiter who uh, uh, was pushing a program called the PLC program, Platoon Leaders Class. And it, that program took a college student in the summer for two summers, for six or seven weeks, uh, gave him a pretty rigorous training, and when he graduated, at the end of his fourth year, they <coughs> commissioned him a second lieutenant in the reserve. Sounds good. And as I said the previous summer, I had had work very hard in, the, in this machine shop, and uh, uh, <coughs> you know, what one job I had, for example, if you want, it's a, <coughs> the, the boss came in and there was a big pile of one-inch iron pipe and he said, John, he said, uh, we need to cut these in, so, in six-foot lengths and five-foot lengths and four-foot lengths, and here's the cutting schedule. And, oh, by the way, here's the hand hacksaw to do it. And oh, so wow. I, <laughs> I saw an iron pipe by hand for two and a half days. And then, in all fairness to the boss, he was a great guy, I said, you know, Mr. Carlson, this is ridiculous. I think I called him Clarence when I was on the first name basis. I said, you could buy a machine for 40 or 50 bucks that could do this in a couple of hours and put your man to more, pro more productive work. He said, John, you're right. Climb in the car with him, you'll go over and buy one, <laughs> which we did. <laughs> Great. Oh, so terrific. I was a hero among the rest of the... Sure. Uh, so at any rate, uh, uh, the end result was that uh, that summer, I did, in fact, uh, go down to PLC in Quantico, Virginia, and uh, sweated a lot and uh, learned a lot and uh, uh, vowed I would be back the next year. However, remember that the, the, uh, re uh, the uh, final requir requirement was that you graduate from, uh, you know, a four-year program, any kind of a program. It didn't make it kind of what it was. Mm -hmm. When I got back, uh, uh, again, having no guidance, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, fact of the matter was I really didn't know what to do. And in talking over with my girlfriend, 
uh, Barbara. Uh, she said, you know, uh, one of my neighbors is a professor in a, in a private business school, she said, that has a great reputation and is sort of a, a leader in some of the new methods of teaching. She said, you might be interested in that. And after all, that, that would give you something to <laughs> fall back on when you go out looking for a job. And so I talked with this gentleman. Uh, I still remember his name, Jack Marston. And the end result, I went over to see the dean of this private business school, who was a character that you wouldn't believe. At any rate, uh, he was uh, very convincing, and the, the cost of it was about the same as the cost of Tufts. And uh, as a result, uh, uh, I did sign on for uh, the four-year program. However, was this the Oxford School of Business Administration? Right. Oh, Cambridge, okay. Yeah. Okay. Does that, excuse me, does that still exist? A name no. I was surprised to hear when I did some research for the interview. Uh, no. Uh, okay. It, uh, it, uh, it was a separate school, I gather, at that uh, time. It was a separate school and was a strictly a private school uh, financed by uh, the uh, dean and his wife. Okay. All right. Thank you. And the end result was that... Uh, I finally I enrolled and worked out a deal, getting credit for most of the courses I had passed at Tufts, and by carrying a fairly heavy load, I could get through in two years. Okay, good. Uh, and getting a diploma, not a degree, a diploma. And uh, so the, <coughs> the uh, meanwhile, uh, I kept worrying about the second summer at the Marine Corps uh, because uh, I was getting a diploma, not a degree. And yet, on the other hand, I'm not even sure that the requirements was, uh, were that you have a degree. You had to have four years of college, put it that way. Okay. At, at least, apparently, that was the way the Marine Corps were interpreted, because in, uh, in class, I got to talk with one of my classmates and told him about the PLC program, and he said, that's great. I'd like to do that. And so he went down to the recruiting office in, in Boston and told them the kind of a program he was in and so forth, and they said that was acceptable. So I didn't have to worry. I knew if I completed my uh, full time at uh, Oxford and the uh, Oxford School of Business, that, in fact, uh, I would get my commission, which is, uh, which is what I did. Good, good. Now, uh, what year would this have been, sir, approximately? What year would this, this be? 1939. Them? Okay, okay. So, uh, uh, I started a job hunt. And 39 was still in the Depression, you know. Yes. And uh, job hunting uh, turned out to be uh, not very successful. I had a couple of interviews. One I thought was going great, but it turns out the person really wanted a person with more experience. I had a fairly strong accounting background as a result of this school. Uh, my grandfather arranged to have him meet one of the executives of the Boston Albany Railroad, and they weren't hiring. And my uh, uncle... Uh, uh, arranged for me to talk with one of the executives of the C.A. Sprague Company, which is a big uh, a, a company supplying coal and various other commodities. Um, so uh, in discussing uh, with, with uh, my uncle uh, about this, he said, you know, he said, uh, uh, Clarence Carlson, the C. Carlson Company, where you worked that summer, he said, is, is seem to be doing fairly well. He said, they don't really have anybody that's trained the way you are. Why don't... Uh, why don't you go talk with Clarence? So I did go to talk with Clarence, and he seemed very happy to see me and offered me a job. With no special assignments, I was thought of his assistant, <laughs> and uh, I was used wherever he thought I might use anything, <clears throat> anything from the bench uh, to going out and uh, um, uh, collecting material or delivering material, you name it. Uh, mm -hmm. I did it. And one, one humorous incident, Clarence uh, always was a little short of money. Uh, of course, that, again, that was the Depression. Uh, and I remember one time uh, I was to pick up uh, some small item uh, at uh, the major hardware store in Boston, which was an old old line hardware. I think it probably dated back to the Puritans. At any rate, uh, it, it was a sight to behold. I wish they had a picture of it. Uh, 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 a real old-time hardware store. Uh, I get the yeah. picture, right? And uh, each uh, uh, counter had a, a a track that ran up overhead, and eventually end to where they put the money in the little uh, container. Oh, sure. And would end up in a central office, which was raised above, so that the person could see all over the the, the main floor. 
and uh, where they're they're the cashier, of course, took the money, and so uh, I uh, uh, got charged the item, <clears throat> and uh, suddenly they boomed out in a voice you could have heard all over the store. It was almost as if it were magnified. It may have been, for all I know, uh, and said, "That young man from Carlton's, you don't get that item unless you pay cash, and you tell." Mr. Carlson, that in the future, that's the only way you'll get any product from here. There was a dead <laughs> silence in the store. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Including you. <laughs> Including me. Right. And, uh, so I reached in my pocket. So Why happened, me, Lord? I'd just been paid. Reached in my pocket, and I had the 4 or $5 I needed to sure. buy it to sell. Um, so it was an interesting experience. Um, meanwhile, uh, Barbara and I had been going steady, and uh, she called. One, the spring before this happened, uh, she suddenly announced she wasn't sure that she wanted to continue going with me. And uh, fortunately, I was a, a strong favorite of a mother. And uh, the mother, who was a, uh, a nurse supervisor in one of the big hospitals in Boston, um, gave me a talk and introduced me to a doctor who also gave me a talk and talked about uh, <coughs> women's uh, being different than men. And essentially what they said, well, look at John, you've, you've been going with her for three years, and she's beginning to wonder whether you're ever going to marry her or not. <laughs> oh, my Lord. <laughs> and so I uh, went ahead and uh, sat down with her and told her I was sorry, and let's set a date. And we did. It was going to be the following Easter. And, of course, we were then formally engaged for the ring and all that kind of thing. Sure. So at any, at any rate, I started to work at Carlson's, and... Uh, because I'm still living with my grandmother and the, the uh, large family. And uh, things were going along pretty well. Uh, I got a small raise, and Barbara, who had started at $12 as the uh, uh, executive secretary of the uh, purchasing manager, John Hank Life Insurance, got some raises. And so I think I was getting twenty-two fifty, and Barbara was getting $16. And we figured that by spring, the following spring, that we uh, could make it. And lo and behold, uh, <clears throat> right after the first of the year, this would have been 1940. 1940, okay. Uh, I got a nice letter from the Marine Corps saying, uh, Lieutenant, uh, we have, we have ju <clears throat> just offered the first class, uh, basic, uh, basic school type of class, uh, to reserve officers. And it's been very successful. And would you like to attend? Please sign up here. So I thought, here I am trying to start a new career in business, and I threw it in the wastebasket. And come spring, I got a third letter. And uh, the Easter we were going to get married was Easter of 41. And uh, it said the same thing. The first and second were very successful. We're now starting a third. Wouldn't you like to come? And I threw that in the wastebasket. Just about, about uh, a week, maybe two weeks after, I get another letter and said the, uh, the third class has been canceled and a new date will be set. I would like to draw your attention to something. There is a war going on over <laughs> in Europe. There's always a possibility the United States may have to defend itself. And then they ended up with this punchline. Would you like to lead a platoon with the amount of training you've had so far? <laughs> I said, oh my God, no. <laughs> so they promised it would only be three months, and I, you know, then we'd get back, come back, and so forth. And, <coughs> excuse me, so I talked with the boss, and he was great, and said, you know, I'll be waiting for you. And talked with Barbara, and she understood. And uh, so we prepared for a three month stay. Well, I got to Quantico. And it was pretty damn sure that at the end of the three months, they were not going to send us home. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, the Marine Corps was desperate. You've got, people don't realize this, but the Marine Corps in the, in the middle 30s was smaller than the New York Police Department. Oh, my Lord. 17,000 men wow. and officers. Good point. I wasn't aware of that. And the end result was that... Uh, their, their reserve, they had some organized reserve battalions, which they, you know, met weekly for drill and so forth. And uh, after my first year in Cornico, I had joined that, and uh, uh, just to keep what I had learned current. 
And so uh, actually I had served in the organized battalion uh, for, uh, until, I, uh, until I got my uh, commission uh, and eventually was a corporal of all things. So uh, I'd had a little of that background too. And at any rate, uh, uh, it was pretty clear that uh, we were not uh, going to be let, let go home. And uh, when I graduated, uh, which was uh, about the middle of early, about the 10th of November, something like that, 1940, um, I got my orders, and I'd asked for orders for assignment on the East Coast, and I got assigned to Cuba. <laughs> oh my! Oh my! Oh my heavens! Oh! Oh! <laughs> so, so Barbara, when she heard that, said. I am not going to let you. I'm not going to wait till next Easter. I'm not going to let you go down there with all those beautiful senoritas. We get married now. So of all things, uh, I had 10 days leave, and the fifth day we were married <laughs> in a church wedding. Uh, in, Massa in Massachusetts? Yeah. Uh, okay. In Watertown, Massachusetts. Okay. And at uh, Fiscal Church. And uh, uh, I had, we had three days honeymoon in New York, and I left uh, for Cuba. And uh, I was in Cuba for uh, oh for four months or so. I eventually got back to the states in uh, in uh, April, first of early April, and uh, fortunately got a uh, twenty-five day leave right at that time. <laughs> and uh, I had uh, saved my money, and uh, my grandmother had given me a little money from a one of these uh, 10 cent a week insurance policies she'd taken out, uh, which came due at 18 when I had, uh, so she had 300 bucks that she could give me. And I bought a new, uh, a new uh, Chevrolet, the top of the line at that time for 900, Great. 950 bucks. Um, so I, I hadn't given Barbara much notice, and, all, and when I'm sure that I had to leave and uh, could buy the car, I just said, I'm coming home and I'll be home in 24 hours. And when I got there, I said, well, dear, we're all set for a good time and relaxation and so we'll get to know one another. Because remember, we'd only seen one of us. Three, right? three days, right? Yeah, there you go. And uh, he said, no, we won't. You didn't give me notice, and my boss has been good to me, and I've got to give him at least a week's notice. So the first <laughs> week of my leave, she was working for them. <laughs> oh, well, you could drive your new car. <laughs> right, I had, I had a new car, yeah. Sure, okay. So at any rate... Uh, that was an interesting uh, experience, and uh, now uh, I had uh, uh, I had uh, I I've had wonderful assignments for the Marine Corps. I'm, I'm very very fortunate. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, when I hit Cuba, they were forming a new regiment, and so I became the platoon leader of the 81 millimeter 81 millimeter mortar platoon in the Second Battalion, Seventh, uh, which meant that. Unlike most second lieutenants, I really didn't have anybody over me. They, they, I reported uh, in terms of uh, operations to the battalion commander. Oh, okay. So I didn't have a company commander over me. So I had the job of starting and building a, uh, a platoon, uh, which is, was much larger than the, the rifle platoon. The rifle, rifle platoon at that time was about 45, 50 men. Uh -huh. My platoon, when it was fully staffed, was 80 men. Okay. And uh, that, then as, uh, as additional duty, he may be mess officer, and uh, that is a scurrilous task. And uh, in those days, you officers had to pay for their food. And one of the things I learned about human nature in that is not all people like to pay on time. Uh, and I would be spend my time, spare time, running around camp, uh, trying to get, <laughs> collect money from these deadbeats, my fellow officers. Mm. So. Uh, I had that, had this very interesting experience, which essentially I was on my own for the, that period down in Cuba, and also later on when I got back. Um, so, uh, Bob and I, uh, uh, the, the uh, first division, which is the basic division I was in, uh, was at that time uh, housed in Paris Island, South Carolina, on a temporary basis. So, Bob and I ended up getting a renting a uh, one bedroom efficiency apartment uh, in Buford, uh, and uh, there we stayed until uh, uh, September, I guess it was. Well, unfortunately, it wasn't much of a get together because after the first month, with Jubilee, the Marine Corps decided we have to practice landing exercises with the First Army Division. So for the next 
six weeks, I was two months, I was aboard ship. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh. And uh, then came the crisis. Uh, I came down with what, uh, a, a couple of days before we were due to disembark and uh, go back to uh, uh, Paris Island. Well, actually, our, our organization had moved on to Camp Lachere in North Carolina. And uh, would you believe it, I came down with what they call cat fever, which was sort of a mild kind of flu. Okay. And uh, While you were on shipboard? I was on shipboard, but about two days before we disembarked. And uh -huh. so, I, because I, I knew the battalion doctor very well, and uh, he used to put me in sick bay, and I felt all right, actually, not like you'd, like you'd have if you had sort of a bad cold. Sure. And um, the uh, day we were disembarked, uh, I still had a slight temperature, and he said, John, under Navy rules, I can't release you to active duty so long as you have a temperature. I said, well, hell, I, you know, it doesn't amount to anything. Well, he said, I'm sorry, but I've got to put you in the Naval Hospital of Charleston, South Carolina. So, oh, wow. and, and the ambulance drives up, I pick up my pack and my, uh, my canvas roll bag, and march down the gangway, throw it in the back of the ambulance, get in, climb alongside the driver, and off we go. <laughs> So we got to the hospital and they assigned me to an officer's ward, in which I was about the only person in it. And uh, I slept there that night. The next morning, the nurse was all excited. She said, Lieutenant, was, was, it's great. She said, we now have a nice private room for you. And I still only was, had a slight temperature. Well, they put me in the private room. And would you guess it? The previous occupant had streptococcus pneumonia. Guess what I came down with? Oh, John! Oh. <laughs> oh. No, so anyway, not then, not good. And so, of course, poor Barbara. Uh, she there. She was up in. Uh, by that time, she found a place in North Carolina, uh, uh, trying to make ends meet on a second lieutenant's salary, and uh, she, <clears throat> she had to pay that rent. Well, fortunately, found somebody to sublet it, and uh, for a couple of months, and then she moved down to. Uh, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and rented the room so she'd come to see me every day. Oh, wow. So at any rate, uh, things kept getting worse, and uh, this morning they couldn't see the, they really didn't know what the devil to do. Uh, the the, the uh, commanding officer of the hospital, a full Navy captain, uh, and of course the doctor, uh, was personally treating me, and I was just getting worse. So finally he called Barbara and he said, Barbara, this thing has got to the stage, he said, where you could lose your husband in the next several days. And I'd appreciate it if you would form the family. So, of course, Barbara did, and my aunt and my grandmother uh, immediately came down, uh, uh, took a train down to Charleston, so they'd be there. And, you know, I'm not, I mentioned earlier that I had so much luck and uh, I don't know, luck, God-given, maybe watching over me. Mm -hmm. But they had just ordered to active duty in the Charleston Naval Hospital. The top uh, 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 expert on pneumonia from one of the Boston, Boston City Hospital. And he came in and he took over, immediately put me on sulfur, which I rejected the first couple of ones, and kept at it, finally got a sulfur drug that I would... Uh, that you could tolerate, yeah. And the end result was, in a couple of days, I was uh, feeling pretty good. And uh, so then, uh, um, uh, the, when that once that had happened, uh, my uh, aunt and grandmother, of course, were going back, and they said they, my aunt came up with the idea. She said, "Barbara, uh, uh, you told me that you had uh, some things back in Boston that you'd like to do, and John's out of danger now." Uh, why don't we leave our train ticket for you, for you and John, and we'll take your car and drive back to Boston. And Barbara and I both thought that was a good idea. And so sure enough, uh, a few days later, Barbara uh, headed for Boston. And what she, the uh, reason she had to get back, she was the uh, matron of honor at her best friend's wedding. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, both of us looked in disbelief at this, uh, this well-known uh, ammonia expert, this doctor, who said, you know, Mrs. Day, he said, uh, you're probably going to come down with this. He said, you've been so close to John, and I know you've kissed him now and then. And he said, this is, this is going to be a, 
a uh, situation in which you're going to have to vote the same thing. We both, neither one of us believe it. So at any rate, uh, I got better and better, and uh, they finally, uh, no, no longer a temperature or anything, and I finally was about ready to go home. And I did have one funny incident, which uh, I don't really want these funny things. To sure, talk. absolutely. Go ahead. <laughs> well, of course, they had me on morphine uh, during that phase to, you know, calm me down a bit and so forth. And uh, I woke up one night, and I'd been having vivid dreams. And I, uh, as I opened my eyes, I was lying on my side, so I was looking at the opposite wall, and there was this huge dragon about <laughs> to devour me. And I let out a yell and leaped out of bed to find it was an enormous cockroach sitting on the lamp, so his shadow was being thrown oh, over. Oh, wow. How about that? <laughs> so, so I oh. grabbed a slipper and made a swipe at him, and he went under the bed. And so I went under the bed after him, trying to get him with my slipper. And here I was in my Johnny with my bare rear end sticking up in the air, and in comes the nurse thinking I've flipped. And she yells for a corpsman to come in and restrain me. <laughs> Do I, I'm taking care of the animals in my room. <laughs> <laughs> so the end result was that uh, we had a laugh over it, and uh, oh, yeah. a couple of other things like that happened. But at any rate, so I get home, I get 30 days leave, sick leave, get home. Where do I find my wife in the hospital? What does she have except the caucus pneumonia? Oh, no. In, she's in Boston, and she got it up there? Yeah. Oh, no, wow. I, I think she got it down there. But oh, yeah, finally... but she was in the hospital up there. Yeah, Okay. Yeah. Oh, so boy. I spent my time visiting her in the hospital the way she spent her, her time down there in mm -hmm. South, South Carolina. Fortunately, she recovered fine. Good. And the wonderful thing, you know, you meet some great people in your life. And one of them was this doctor who was a good friend of my mother-in-law and who was the one that counseled me when the early stages when Barbara was having doubts about whether or not she wanted to get married. Mm -hmm. um, and he took care of, wonderful care of Barbara and would not submit a bill. <laughs> oh, that's nice. And, uh, you know, you don't find many people like that. No, you don't. And it, it's really nice. You know. It sure is. It sort of makes you, it gives you a full belief in human nature. That's right, yeah. So at any rate, uh, uh, we went uh, back to... Uh, uh, North Carolina, and uh, Barbara got a, uh, uh, an apartment, uh, second floor apartment in uh, Newbury, North Carolina, about 30, 38 miles from camp. And it wasn't too bad. Uh, I'd occasionally get home on a weekend. Uh, I married on a Wednesday, and I got home most weekends. And we, at that time, uh, uh, of course, we. Uh, Pearl Harbor hadn't occurred yet. Uh, it was probably a lot of around Thanksgiving time, I guess. And uh, the, uh, there were rules regarding uh, taking off in a week were fairly lax. And uh, then came Pearl Harbor and all things changed. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the Marine Corps, of course, was. Uh, immediately put on uh, alert status and uh, I had by this I had I think the first day of September just our uh, first day of December just changed jobs I've been asked to become it was a step up for me and uh, to become uh, assistant R4 that's logistics and uh, munitions officer in charge of the regimental munitions um, and give up my job as a, a platoon leader and I accepted it well, for the next uh, several months, uh, we were fiddling around one way or another. Uh, we were supposed to go on maneuvers. And, uh, of course, until you've been through this, you don't realize how unprepared we were in this country for the, the World War II. Mm -hmm. For example, when I had my platoon, it rated four mortars. For months, I only had one mortar, and it was one of the old, very oldest models. And then uh, we did get a second one. But I still only had two when I gave the, the platoon up. Uh, we were supposed to go on maneuvers, but there's no way they could supply us with the munitions and so forth that we had to presumably pack uh, for, a, for a, a landing. And so one of my jobs as munitions officer, I had to create fake munitions uh, 
so we could pack and you know get the ex the uh, experience of sure. going and this kind of thing. Sure. So uh, I uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, the 81 mil millimeter mortars come in in a, in a cardboard tube, which are bound together in three as a. So these three tubes make up this sort of tri uh, setup. So what we did was we went out in the woods, and of course there were plenty of woods down there in North Carolina on this reservation we were on. We cut down trees approximately the same size as the cardboard cartons would be, and then band them together with steel wire. <laughs> oh, wow. And then, then to represent the ammunition boxes, we had to get some lumber. Sure. And the Marine Corps didn't have any lumber. And so. Uh, uh, this place we'd take over, uh, uh, taken over there in North Carolina, had a number of summer homes on the river. And uh, so my boss got permission to dismantle one of the summer homes. And I was, took charge of the work party to get it done. We get out there, and it was a very nice cottage. <laughs> and I got the men working. And of course, one of the problems I had initially was I, I needed boards. I didn't need splinters. In a, Kelsey Marine was tended to make splinters when he started to pull these boards sure. off. Sure, okay. And uh, so I uh, got things going and left to do another uh, job and came back. And all work had ceased, and there was an attractive young lady sitting on the porch crying her eyes out. And it turns out uh, it was her family's summer home. And Oh, wow. And uh, so my job was to get her off the porch without using physical violence and try to tell her, you know, what this is all and, and for the good of the country and defense of the country and so forth and so on. And I guess I did a fairly convincing job because eventually she dried the tears and thanked me for being so understanding and uh, went her way. Well, I heaved a big sigh of relief and, and uh, continued the work. And in the afternoon we left and with our boards. And uh, when I got into camp, I was, a runner approached me and says, Lieutenant, uh, uh, Colonel so and so wants to see you. I said, What do you want to see me for? I don't know, sir. He said, As soon as I return to camp, I said, immediately have a report to him. So, all dusty and <laughs> so forth. I think I washed my face and hands. I went up, and this Colonel started to really berate me. He said, Do you know what you've done? I said, Yes, sir. I just have been pulling a cottage apart. That's just the point. You shouldn't have been doing that. That cottage was assigned to the. Uh, Assistant Division Command, oh, Chief of Staff of the 1st Marine Division. Now you've torn it down. Who would help? No, 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 no. I kept saying, sir, I only obeyed orders. Sir, I only obeyed orders. So I did what I was supposed to do. Yeah, sure. I was told to do this. So eventually I went to my boss, uh, Freddie Weisman, and I said, Freddie, when he got through, I said, you've got to get over there and explain to these people that you had permission. So he got over and uh, explained that he had permission from what they call a G4, that's the, the division head of logistics. Mm -hmm. And uh, then came back shaking his head. He says, it's pretty bad when the members of the staff don't even talk to one another. That's right. <laughs> I, I know what you mean. <laughs> so the end result was that uh, uh, I had this new job, and I enjoyed it, and I loved the, I, 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 the boss that uh, I had was just absolutely terrific. And um, so... Uh, Fifth of April, we got marching orders, uh, uh, and uh, they, they took out my regiment and some additional attached units and sent us to Samoa, uh, British Samoa, that was at that time ruled by New Zealand, because they had cracked the Navy code, and after the Japs were supposed to have hit Midway, there was a, the, an out, part of the outfit was to head south and take on take over Samoa. Um, so we got out there, and uh, uh, it was a... Uh, <laughs> A pretty decent uh, assignment. Uh, shortly after we uh, arrived uh, and after we got assembled, uh, we, they moved us out to put us in defense spots around the island. And uh, the uh, <laughs> I, I, I laugh about this. Our first casualty of our regiment was this: the trucks were carrying our troops out to uh, the, the location that we were going to set up the, of the fortifications on. Uh, we, we were going along the shore road, and from the mountains in Samoa, these streams would come down and cross the road. And he, er, every, or er, every uh, 
stream crossed the road. There usually was a little native village, mm -hmm. and they had dammed the stream to have a little kind of a swimming pool and so forth. And uh, in one, one place you went by, there were a number of nubile Samoan ladies uh, taking a bath. And mm -hmm. uh, the, oh, the Marines got so excited, one of them leaned so far out of the truck, he fell out and broke his ass. <laughs> 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 First casualty of the 1st Marine Division, 1st <laughs> 7th Marine. Um, at any rate, uh, we were there in Samoa uh, with uh, uh, just all the kinds of things you would do uh, in a uh, fairly peacetime setting, actually. Uh, but we knew it couldn't last. And uh, so we were found, the uh, 7th Marines were uh, normally a part of the 1st Division. And as you know, the 1st Division uh, landed on Guadalcanal in August, uh, and uh, by September they were saying, we want our 7th Marines, we need our 7th Marines. And so uh, my, my regiment moved into Guadalcanal uh, uh, around the 15th or 18th of September. And I was there uh, uh, until uh, the 7th Marines left, which is the 5th of, uh, 5th of January. Okay. And we, you know, we enjoyed the, the usual things, but uh, unlike uh, uh, some of my buddies from the uh, third uh, officer's class, uh, I ended up as the, uh, say, the division munitions officer. My job was to maintain the stocks of ammunition that would be ready that we could send up to the front lines uh, when the need was required, and also to maintain the the, the stocks at, at the required level by drawing from the division. And so I was a, a, had a pretty interesting job, and particularly when on October 25th the Japanese launched a major attack on our front lines and uh, in, the, in the black of the night, and uh, I had to go around. I, was, I and my sergeant were the only ones that really knew where all of this stuff was buried. Sure. <laughs> yeah, right. And so my job was to go around and uh, uh, get them out, get the working parties going, and get the stuff going up to the front line. Um, actually, our position was right next to the airport, and that was the that was the aiming spot for the Japanese the bombers. And so we were bombed every day, uh, pretty much there for some weeks. Mm -hmm. And then they then they brought artillery in, and they were they, and the airport again was the aiming port of the artillery, and they didn't always make it. So once in a while we uh, we. Uh, Got around a little closer than we want. <laughs> yeah, that occurs. Oh yeah. Sure. So at any rate, uh, uh, that uh, was my job, and uh, about the uh, first of December, uh, my boss was called up to the division, uh, regimental command post. Came back with sort of a long piece Johnny and said, "I got some bad news for you." And I said, "What's that?" He said, "Oh yeah, one officer. That's the person in charge of uh, records." so forth and recruiting and all that kind of thing, um, has uh, succumbed to war neurosis and they had to get him off the island in a hurry. And the uh, exec feels that you would be the uh, proper person to fill his place. Well, by this time I'd made captain and I knew I did, the job I was in didn't write a captain, but this new job did. So I ended up in a completely new job and uh, oh, good. Uh, held that job until we <laughs> got, off, got off the island and landed in Melbourne, Australia in the middle part of January. And uh, then, of course, uh, uh, for about three months, uh, life was pretty hectic because uh, this is hard to believe, yes, but because of malaria, we had almost, half, I guess it was about half of our regiment either in sick bay or on light duty from malaria, and uh, so I was constantly involved in getting men in and out of the hospitals and getting new men in, sending all, sending men back. They, they, they call for certain cadre from the states of experienced people that they could use to start building new organizations back in the states. So, mm -hmm. so about three months, I, wow. <laughs> I didn't know which end was up. What were they using, what do they use that, to treat you for that? Was that, so they were using sulfur for that? No, uh, the, adamant. Oh, okay. The artificial uh, uh, drug. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. So that was very prevalent in World War II. Yeah. Uh, quinine, of course, was. Quinine the, uh, was the Japanese other one. That's right. And uh, the 
nice thing about it, the, the nice thing that uh, the thing that uh, most men objected to was that they were scared stiff. The rumor around that uh, uh, that this thing uh, is a strange new drug that turned you yellow. Actually, your skin got yellow. Uh, uh, would limit their manly prowess, and uh, as a result, uh, they took all kinds of ways to avoid uh, taking it. <laughs> okay. you, you used to have to station, station a sergeant in the mess line who would pop the pill in their mouth and then make sure they swallowed it. Yeah. Uh, at any rate, uh, so the uh, life in, uh, 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 <coughs> in Australia was mostly training, and then this first three months, which was a frantic getting new people and old people out and so forth. And uh, about the time uh, we were getting settled down again and getting things smoothly running in the training, uh, I was promoted to major. And uh, uh, shortly after that, my, which, which my job no longer rated, uh, shortly after that, the uh, regimental commander said uh, a special group were being put together to go up and evaluate the new ships that were being used to make landings, the LS, LCIs and LSTs and so forth, which we in the Marine Corps had never seen before. So I was one of about a half a dozen officers who were sent up to a, an army landing against an unopposed island to evaluate uh, uh, whether or not the Marine Corps used these and what were the problems with them and so forth. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting uh, kind of duty. And, oh, yeah. Uh, when I got back, of course, I was writing up my reports and spent some time writing up the reports. Uh, but uh, my job had essentially been taken over by a warrant officer. And so I thought, what the hell is going to happen to me? <laughs> and then I get a good friend of mine who was commanding a battalion called me up and, uh, well, I'll back off a bit. Uh, I got a call from the uh, um, division. Uh, adjutant and I won and said, John, uh, he said, uh, we're forming a special brigade and uh, they need a logistics officer. And would you be interested? Well, I knew I didn't have any job in the 7th. And I said, sure, I'd be interested. Well, he said, uh, then I'll put your name down as being the one we, when he, when he sat putting the staff together. And uh, he Two days later, I got a call from this friend of mine who was commanding officer of the 2nd Battalion, 7th, and said, would you be interested in being my executive officer? <laughs> and I said, well, as a matter of fact, I would, be, I would have been a couple of weeks ago. I said, but right now I've got this new other job which sounds exciting. And it was. Uh, it, what we were doing was forming a special brigade to attack a little town on the southern coast of New Britain Island. The idea was that that was to draw Japanese troops off while the main main attack was going to be at Cape Foster in the northern part of the island. Oh, okay. And uh, it was to be led by our uh, assistant division commander, who at that time was Bill Rupertus. And he had, uh, he had already started to assemble the staff in his quarters, uh, which was a lovely summer home. Uh, designed by an architect. If you can believe it, it had a thatched roof on it. <laughs> uh, and, uh, of course, there was a regular roof under it. Sure. Uh, and uh, so I showed up and uh, was greeted warmly by the you know, by General Curtis and uh, told me that uh, I wanted to move right in. And uh, I was the bunk with one of the other office, staff officers in a separate bedroom and that they had their own uh, kitchen and their own uh, mess staff. And I'd take the meals there. I thought, oh boy, John, have you lucked into it. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but uh, within the matter, I think of maybe only maybe a week or 10 days, uh, we got word that uh, General Vandegrift uh, was being moved to a corps and that General Rufus was being promoted up to uh, uh, in, in charge of the division uh, as a major general. So here I was, <laughs> no boss again. But only about a day later, a Brigadier General uh, uh, showed up, a new one, and uh, Shepard, Lemuel Shepard, and uh, completely different. Uh, General Curtis was very much involved in uh, in himself, and a big ego, 
was had a certain amount of paranoia about other people. Always treated me well. Don't misunderstand me. Always treated me well. But clearly, he had problems. Mm -hmm. uh, but this fellow who came in was a com he was a hero in World War One, and completely different. Uh, very uh, relaxed, uh, very friendly, uh, uh, very helpful, uh, and just a wonderful guy. And uh, so at any rate, uh, we uh, had our whole group, a whole company of every, everything you can imagine that would be needed to run a brigade. And then they called off the, <laughs> they called off the attack. Oh, okay. And uh, at any rate, uh, we kept our group together and uh, kept Cut, cut this little shot, kept that group together. And when we landed on Cape Gloucester, we were given a separate assignment by General Rupertus uh, to go out on our own and attack southward towards the ball, which we did. And uh, we were pretty successful and cleaned out the area that he assigned to us without any trouble. Mm -hmm. I say any trouble, we had casualties, of course. Oh, but, sure. Uh, but but you're able to handle it. Yeah, I'm able to handle it. Sure. And uh, so then uh, <laughs> we. Uh, uh, we're supposed to, after the camp, successful campaign was over, uh, we were supposed to uh, go into a rest camp. And everybody said, "Oh boy, back to uh, well, uh, back to Australia, to Melbourne." Uh, everybody, all the young, all the young guys are thinking about all the girlfriends they left behind and so forth. And they sent us to an island called Pavuvu, about 30 or 40 miles, uh, 30 miles uh, north of uh, in the Russells, 30 miles north of Guadalcanal. It had absolutely nothing but a coconut grove. <laughs> <laughs> that I, I would imagine was what you got. Uh, there you go. And so we uh, we uh, had quite a job making it a livable place. Uh, um, the, uh, meanwhile, I had uh, I had a, uh, an additional assignment. I was made the assistant to D3. Uh, oh, I should have mentioned that, that under Shepard, he'd switch me from four, which are logistics, to three, which is plans and operations. And uh, so uh, I was also assigned as the assistant D3 uh, in the division. Uh, so uh, I had two jobs in a sense, uh, uh, although uh, neither one of them required full time in, in, the, in the base camp. Um, and uh, that's the way it was uh, uh, until <laughs> Uh, we got ready to go to Pelalu, which is a completely different story. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, one one event which uh, uh, I'll never forget. Uh, we uh, because we were on this sort of remote place, we didn't have an airport. What we did have was a long stretch of coral road, and we did have a squadron of these uh, like Piper Cubs, and uh, they, could, they could take off and land on this stretch of road. And all we used them for was transportation uh, by <coughs> someone who just didn't want to spend the time going by boat to uh, Guadalcanal or to Benica, which was the uh, big supply island. So at any rate, uh, our uh, officer, athletic officer, heard that Bob Hope uh, and Jerry Colonna, Francis Langford, and uh, Patty Thomas, uh, I'll never forget them, <laughs> were putting on a show over at Benica where they had a big airport. <coughs> so he grabbed a pipe of cup and he flew over to uh, t and asked them would they put on a show for us if he ferried them one at a time uh, over to our place. So uh, we got the three or four of the pipe of cubs over and each one of them picked up one of them. <coughs> now, don't forget Jerry Colonna, the troops were massed along the because we, we had a, never had much in the way of entertainment. Sure. <coughs> along either side of the road. And uh, so as Jerry Colonna came in, he uh, uh, and the plane buzzed the, the road, <coughs> he uh, leaned out of the window and gave his famous yell. <laughs> and all the troops roared, you know, oh, 10,000 sure. 10, voices yeah, roaring at that, him. Yeah, I remember Jerry Colonna. <laughs> so the end result was that uh, uh, we, we had one of our very few uh, Entertainment by uh, the uh, that, that was really nice. Uh, well, it was. It sure, was nice they needed and, that. And Hope uh, uh, went out of his way because it wasn't scheduled or anything for him. It was completely additional duty. So at any rate, uh, came time uh, for Peleliu, and 
uh, I was uh, told that I would go in as, as the assistant three, uh, setting up the uh, uh, operations uh, uh, headquarters <coughs> uh, in the initial assault. And so uh, uh, I and uh, several other uh, members of uh, friends of mine under O.P. Smith, who was the assistant division commander, went in, uh, I think, on the fourth or fifth wave in the Palo and set up the division command post uh, and ran the thing for the first 24 hours until uh, the commanding general came ashore with his staff. So uh, it was an ex that was an experience. <laughs> yeah, I imagine. Right. And, uh, and uh, I was there. Uh, uh, eventually, I uh, ended up. Uh, well, it was an unfortunate situation. Uh, the idea was that uh, after the main uh, main uh, division command post came ashore, uh, then I would revert back to be working with the assistant division commander rather than being the assistant D three. In other words, uh, uh -huh. and. Uh, what happened was uh, a day or so after the uh, General Rupertus and his staff took over, I had was in the command post for some reason or other alone with the a new assistant three, and uh, he was a, an escapee from the Philippines, a nice guy, <coughs> but he had no staff experience at all. And why they, for heaven's sakes, uh, put him on the staff, I don't know. Because remember, he was a second lieutenant when he was captured, and he was a major when they uh, when they brought him uh, out of uh, the Philippines. Uh, mm. And in that time, he had no, no experience with her. So uh, I just happened to be in the command post when I heard him say, uh, uh, give orders to the Navy that uh, they, were to, they were to uh, uh, attack this peninsula with gunboats. Now the gunboats were converted LTIs that had these five inch rocket launchers on it. Uh -huh. And they would launch a barrage of 20 or 30 rockets and they'd just cover a place. I mean, they just, just one explosion after another. And I thought, I said, oh my God, Bill, uh, I've just come from there and we've got Marines all over that point. Uh, not in foxholes, they're attacking. And you'll wipe the Marines out. So uh, I grabbed the phone from him and, and uh, yelled, aboard, aboard, aboard mission, Marines on the point, aboard mission, so on. And uh, of course they did. Sure. And uh, uh, when the uh, <laughs> when the three officer, my boss, uh, later on, later than my boss, uh, heard about it, he was really upset. And uh, if just by chance I hadn't been there, there have been maybe 150, 200 dead Marines. Right, right. So he uh, didn't say anything. The next thing I knew, I got orders to report to the division command post and uh, become the new ADC, ADC. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, D3, I'm sorry. Okay. Sure. So I served in that position, much to the unhappiness of my uh, the Brigadier General, who I normally work with, uh, until uh, we left the island. Um, well, then, uh, by that time, I had almost 30, 33 months in, mm -hmm. and uh, it was time to go home. <laughs> sure, right. Okay. So I managed to get home through a lot of uh, help from uh, various uh, people along the way, uh, two days before Thanksgiving, uh, before Christmas. <laughs> okay, sounds good. <laughs> and that was quite a reunion. Sure, right. My, my, uh, turns out that my son, at the time, was 26 months old. Oh. <laughs> and I, the first time I've seen him. Sure. And, uh, Professor oh. Day, let me ask you this. We've got some other material, and I, I like to try to just on um, a compliment okay, to the. No, no, no. Um, what I'm going to ask you, if it's okay with you, could we do a part two if I could reschedule that? Would that be okay? Oh, sure. And we'll sure. pick, uh, because we've really got a lot of material that I want to cover. Right. Uh, I think we'll. Um, now that we got the service, then the next thing I think will be when you come to Purdue. How does that sound? Okay. Would that be all right? Sure. Now, um, I will uh, give you, uh, I'm going to double check your email. Let me, I'm going to log off and then I'll just talk with you for a second.